All right. Hello, everyone, and uh, hello to everybody who's joining us online. Uh, we are here for Dr. Gitanjali Kapoor's lectures on AMR surveillance best practice. Um, thank you again. Today, Dr. Kapoor will continue with discussion of AMR surveillance reports and the challenges and mitigations in AMR surveillance. So just uh, to go through some quick housekeeping items. Yes, this lecture series is being recorded and will be shared on the Global Health uh, Network platform. To automatically translate the speech to subtitles in your chosen language, please go to the closed captions, select the closed captions function and select your language. Due to the number of participants, your video and microphone have been muted. Please use the chat function to introduce yourself or to report any technical problems. And please use the Q&A function to post your questions and comments. And you can do so anonymously if you like. And without further ado, I'm going to turn over the floor to Dr. Kapoor. Thank you. Thank you, Barney. Good morning, everybody. Or good evening, good afternoon, wherever you are. Hope you had a nice weekend. So we resume our uh, lecture series. Today is the fourth day. Uh, and uh, we have so far, we do a quick recap also of what all has uh, been uh, discussed in the last three days. So we began these uh, lecture series on Wednesday, the 9th of October, where we gave an orientation general about the importance of uh, AMR surveillance, uh, what are the global efforts that are uh, there? And um, we talked a bit technical stuff uh, like uh, definitions of uh, XDR, pan drug resistance, multi drug resistance, and uh, who are the AMR stakeholders. So we give overview and importance of AMR. Thereafter, on day two, we uh, started talking about uh, the AMR surveillance uh, programs, how they are set up. So uh, you can see on the slide now, so we basically covered on the second day, the first five steps, which are there on the extreme left. Uh, there is this uh, flow chart I'm showing. So we did the first five steps on day two. How is the team made? What is a problem statement on which we have to uh, start working on so as to make the AMR surveillance system and all that. Uh, the third day was all devoted to discussing the sixth box, which is data management. Of course, that's a huge area. It talks about everything from uh, how to start collecting data, even prior to that, the planning that goes into it, data review, analysis, so that was a long session we had all clubbed right now to show for the ease into box six. Now, today we'll be talking about basically the seventh and the eighth box. That's the presentation. So uh, that and the report writing. Now, why are we going to do the presentations? Of course, we have to do the presentations. After all, you have uh, worked hard. You have uh, done... Uh, uh, made your efforts in setting up a surveillance system, either uh, as part of your hospital policy or maybe as part of a program. It could be just, um, you know, uh, based on some funding requirement, they need uh, to strengthen the surveillance system. So regardless of why you did it, uh, you, uh, you need to now start sharing your findings, okay? Now, is it that you will share your findings right at the end? or is it that you do it even before that? So we'll start talking of all that. So that is where presentations comes. Now, uh, if you see on my slide, uh, I have shown why, why do we do a presentation? We'll just deep dive into that. Who's the audience for that? Um, when do we do it? And then how do we do that, okay? So why? Why is important, as I mentioned, we need to share our findings. Uh, our progress. So let's not, not say the findings, the progress. You know, so regularly you have to keep uh, informing and updating the stakeholders who are there, the key stakeholders, about where we are. Because, you know, uh, there is a sense of accountability you also have uh, when you are doing this study. After all, it's based on, if it's a funding, then it's based on uh, the taxpayers' money. So you need to keep uh, giving a timely update. Uh, you are owning this particular exercise. So it's your responsibility to do that. 
Uh, it also helps us in uh, facilitating direct conversations with these key stakeholders, helps us to contextualize whatever has happened so far, even if they're not the final results, the prior results, and you know, also helps in fostering further collaborations in the future. And then uh, many a times on these fora where you are doing your presentations, you can also have a lot of cross learning. Uh, for example, if it happened to be a multi uh, consortia grant, you know, one grant and they've selected uh, different groups across different parts of the globe. So maybe you have somebody from Asia, Africa, Europe, US, so those guys come together at some frequency and they all discuss what they have done, what were their challenges. So you learn a lot from those different contexts. Uh, it also helps you know, to kind of tweak your methodology. Suppose something didn't work in your case for whichever reason. Then of course, you know that there are people who had the same problem. How did they problem solve it? And then that's like, it's also like you're doing, you're doing a, in a way, focus group discussion, brainstorming like that. And uh, sometimes, of course, these presentations are so handy, they, they are evidence for some immediate policy decision or maybe towards the terminal end of that project, it helps with that. And uh, of course, uh, policies and then broader public health efforts are also guided through whatever has come up as evidence. Now, who are the audience? The audience, uh, will, you can just think through it, you know, I mean, like, do I have it down for you, but just think about why are you doing it? Uh, or who are you going to present these findings to? So it has to be your, your funders because uh, they have uh, put the money on money for this. So they have to be informed. Uh, the healthcare providers, they play, play, play a very integral role. After all, we're talking of AMR surveillance, so it's in a healthcare setting. Uh, the policy makers, because in the end, you know, when uh, you do come up with some brilliant evidence or some suggestions, recommendations. They don't have to fall in deaf ears. They have to go to the body, which finally may take some action. So we have a, a continuity of the surveillance in the future, and we also are working towards AMR mitigation. The researchers. Researchers really benefit with these presentations because you know, it could be a postdoc, it could be a PhD student, it could be just anybody, maybe even drug developers. They, they learn so much from these presentations. So everybody who's there in the AMR community world, they all are, uh, they all directly or indirectly benefit from these presentations. And then the community organizations for the nonprofits, for profits, international, etc. So again, this depends on the scope of your uh, your study. You have to define your audience like that. So now on the next slide, we're going to talk about when will you do these presentations? Is it any fixed time? Uh, do you do it every week, every day? Uh, when do you do it? So let's just. And there, again, what all I'm saying is, uh, just like best practices, uh, it's finally in the hands of the project lead. He can always you know, modify depending on the context, depending on uh, your resources, your availability and everything. So these things are not like etched in stone, but these are just kind of recommendations and best practices. So uh, it would be good you know, if the core team, which is actually working on the surveillance study, they should definitely try to meet every week. So you can say, okay, every Thursday, Friday, Tuesday, whatever. So they meet, you know, what do they do on those meetings? I mean, what are you presenting? So it could be an informal uh, discussion, either online or on site, if everybody's together. Uh, you just give your progress, what's happened for the last, uh, say, in the last week. Uh, so this is important, you know, it also kind of makes everybody working. I mean, it's not that, because if you normally have these, and the core team especially, because they are supposed to be working daily on this. So I think every week, if you say it's not asking for too much, it's just kind of understanding what happened, any challenges they had, um, uh, how, how does the rest of the team think that they can kind of help each other in solving. So everybody may have a different kind of challenge they discuss. Uh, you also avoid a lot of redundancies. Everybody's working on you know different aspects at the same time. It's that all the dots are getting joined. So you need to have these weekly meetings. What about with the funder? Now this this 
this actually totally depends upon what does the funder want. He may want um, every two monthly, he may want every monthly. So this all depends, but typically it's good that, I mean, uh, most of the time a funder does expect a monthly report or a say three monthly report to go to him. And prior or after that, they like to have discussions with the project team. So we have to decide the frequency, how frequently you want to meet the funder. Now, also, it's important to uh, have meetings with uh, the main study site uh, administration team. So the study site could be at a country level or it could be a laboratory level. So uh, they should always be updated, you know, every uh, half yearly should be good about what's the progress been, uh, whether the data collection has started, etc. So they are also to be informed. And before end of this uh, period, say you had been assigned, you had got a five-year uh, big grant uh, to be executed in five years. So before you actually culminate, uh, your results are pretty much ready. So that's also a good time. You know, you can have about one or two meetings before the real end of the deadline to share the near uh, uh, terminal findings, or let's say, you know, even interim findings can be shared at some midpoint, uh, just to kind of share uh, the uh, information you have got through all your efforts. And uh, sometimes you, you really get good insights from uh, the stakeholders. And you may need to do some of this midterm review, midterm uh, tweaking on certain aspect. Maybe at times your objectives were too, uh, you know, expansive, and you really feel that no, well, it's not feasible to kind of meet all those objectives in this period of time. Or maybe you want to add on something if you have some extra findings. So it's it's always good, you know, to have your uh, uh, meetings even prior to the actual terminal part of your study period. Uh, terminal, of course, is so important. That's the time when the findings are actually disseminated with everybody. All the audience whom I went mentioned earlier, they are there, that's terminal. And uh, around that time, uh, even the actual uh, hard copy of the reports. So if it's like you are talking to multiple sites or multiple sites were uh, part of this surveillance program, then all of them have to be given a copy of what were their findings. So we call it a country report or uh, some kind of a policy brief. Those reports also have to be shared with, the, uh, with these different sites. Now, you can also do presentations at various, you know, conferences which are there. So that can be done at any point of time. But it's always good to kind of showcase that, well, you know, we have uh, started off this surveillance program. You could do it at a global forum. You could do it some, uh, you know, uh, public health uh, meetings at, the, uh, at some, say, uh, regional level. There are some events you can have it there. Also, sometimes internally, you know, you have your board meetings. Over there also, you can just tell them that, well, you know, we are also doing this major uh, uh, exercise part of our, our, our faculty or our teams. We are involved in uh, running a surveillance study in um, XYZ locations. You can discuss those findings at the board meeting. And then in real time, throughout, I mean, these are all at, uh, at certain points what I mentioned, but real time is like you can actually have it been uh, broadcasted throughout by your comms team through digital platforms. So you can, sh it could be a social media, institutional websites, um, and you can have some dedicated AMR databases where this information keeps going regularly, again, depending on how much progress has happened. This just enhances the visibility of the results. And especially in the real time is important. It helps to facilitate uh, a lot of uh, information uh, going uh, across to different uh, audiences, it, like has a broader reach, especially amongst younger audiences and even non-specialist stakeholders. So there comes the importance of the digital platforms. Now, how do you uh, how do you go ahead with uh, these presentations? What's the format? Uh, so you can have a progress report, which can go regularly to your funder and to your uh, core stakeholder. So these are your progress reports. 
you can have some brief executive summaries going at a very frequent intervals every four monthly, six monthly, you know, till whatever has happened, those things can be put into a small executive summary. Uh, you can also have some this policy briefs. Normally, policy briefs will go towards the tail end when everything's over. So you that that time is the time when policy briefs are dead up. You can have detailed technical reports, which are actually what I was talking about in the end when you hand over uh, the the final project report. So that's basically your detailed technical report, or it could be some, if it's at a country level, you can say a country report. So these are all, you know, terminologies, but uh, your project group can decide on what do you want to call that particular document. Digital platforms we just discussed. And also you can share your findings uh, on the peer reviewed scientific journals at an appropriate point of time. Some, sometimes during the course of a study, you just thought about, you know, uh, some new, um, idea which you would like to share across, like for example, you thought about uh, uh, some new statistical technique which you think would really be helpful uh, for, for sharing with the wider uh, stakeholders and also you would be maybe using it or piloting it in your study. So you know this is all about research findings. So you can, uh, you can just uh, share this across other peer-reviewed scientific journals, it adds credibility, contributes to the global body of knowledge on AMR, and the process also allows for external research validation, encouraging further studies in this field. Now, over here, uh, if you see, there's a small little colorful graph. That's just like <laughs> to show you uh, if you have four countries, for example, that you're working on. So the green, um, I don't have the legend here, but the green is like, it's uh, going on oranges, sorry, green is it's completed, oranges it's uh, in the mid middle, it's, it's uh, ongoing, and red is not started. <laughs> so this is just very simple, you know, and, and try to use as many colors, innovations, there is no set uh, format of a presentation. Whatever you make, it should be easily understandable, especially for a progress report. These kinds of things are helpful, like, you know, uh, whether the, the country workshop, which happened right in the beginning when we discussed earlier, you have workshops, right? When you start engaging with the countries. So what's the status for some countries? You know, it's not easy to do these workshops. So, of course, you might just have a red color there and uh, whether the data agreements were signed, even that is actually a bottleneck many a times. And uh, as you work, you'll get to know that. Uh, facility selection is, so these are actually, you know, in the same order in which if you see on the left-hand side, the way I have written that flow chart, it's now uh, over here, I'm showing it in the, it's transposed like that. So you can show these kinds of snapshots, bird's eye view. <clears throat> now, so we finished the seventh box, and now we are coming to the report writing, the main thing. Now, irrespective of whether you present as an executive summary or you present as whatever I told you, those different types of uh, progress report, a policy brief, whatever. The idea is that your final report or your internal report or your progress report, you know, it should be giving a full picture uh, to the extent that you have done your work or you want to kind of share. Uh, it should be having different sections. So this is something which you all as researchers already know, but it would be interesting to just refresh ourselves. So the cover page is so important. I mean, cover pages actually just tells everything about your, your, uh, your study or your report. It has to be uh, telling you, so we'll go one by one into all of these today, okay? Uh, so we'll talk about what's the executive summary like, what should that be, how is it different from an overview, uh, what else you should talk about, an institutional profile, what all should you include in that, then what are the various activities that you did? So if you go back on the left-hand side, I've drawn those eight boxes, out in those eight boxes from box number, um, basically six, the box number six are the various activities, right? So you can then speak about all those activities in your report. 
uh, various challenges that you have seen. So a final report should actually have all this. But of course, if you're doing an interim report, you may not have all these sections or whatever is applicable, you keep that. Your recommendations would be there. Any limitations that you have, limitations are slightly different from challenges. Many a time we do use it synonymously and that's okay. But if you really think of it, they're, they're slightly different. And of course, your references should always be there. And appendices, very important. The final report should be like literally everything consolidated together. So let's go on the cover page. Cover page, it should, it's very simple. It's the way like when you write your, say your thesis or anything, your institution's name, uh, project name. So there's a difference between the project and the program, okay? So program would be a little larger one. Project would be the small, various small projects you're doing under a bigger uh, program. But again, these are semantics. You might be using a different terminology. Please feel free to tweak, but do give name of your project. Uh, who is the funder? It's always good to uh, acknowledge the funder on your cover page. You know, this was funded by XYZ funder or you know, philanthropy or whatever the year. Uh, when you actually have uh, published or you're putting forth that particular report, so cover page talks, and your project team's name. Little different sometimes from the project name. So what's your team's name? Do you have, have you given some kind of a name to your team? Many times you have, so you, it's good to kind of put all that. Uh, then we move to the, the main body. Now we come to the executive summary. Now, we all know that executive summary is basically, you know, for an executive who's just running and who just needs to know everything in two pages. He may not have the time to read that entire report, starting from overview to appendices. So for him, so I've grayed out the parts which I'm not talking and what's over, again, is great. So cover page we've done, I've grayed it out. And we have not started on overviews and graded out. We are focusing only on the executive summary. Then that's the order in which a report is going to be. Again, most of the times, still your project lead can take a call. He wants to introduce some other sections or kind of club something. It's up to them. So in an executive summary, as I mentioned, very comprehensive, quick reference for the decision maker to just grasp the key points without delving into the full content. Now, even then, it's more like, you know, an abstract. You can think like that. So you will talk about uh, the purpose. Why was this entire surveillance program done? Problems. You can also use another term like a problem statement, purpose. And then talk about the key findings, just the top level key findings. Don't have to get into too much of detail here in the executive summary. So just the top, maybe few, four to five uh, key uh, findings uh, can be mentioned there. And also the approach that was adopted need not go into a detail about the methodology here because there's a different section. But overall approach, you can just say that, you know, we did literature review or it was a case study, it was a qualitative or quantitative analysis, uh, or it was a field work from multiple regions. So that kind of approach is mentioned. Uh, on the key findings also, you know, you just have to like, just highlight a few things like we can, especially near AMR surveillance, we know uh, we could talk about say, the AMR surveillance uh, system showed considerable variation across regions, highlighting the need for standardizing methodologies. Uh, you can talk about there were gaps in data collection and analysis that were observed especially in certain resource uh, settings, hence it hinders comprehensive AMR tracking. You can talk about, again, in the key findings, um, about effective collaboration is uh, going to significantly improve uh, further uh, policies and AMR data sharing uh, protocols. So those kinds of things come in your key findings. Again, remember, we're talking of AMR surveillance, so everything pertaining to, to that. And uh, we, we did the problem statement, just like it could be very simple, understanding impact of AMR surveillance programs in various healthcare settings. That's one example. Or you, depending, again, on what kind of research you're doing. So of course, every, every program has some kind of a reason why you're doing it, right? And so this is how we have this executive summary built up.
and uh, the actionable insights would be basically then you'd offer some kind of recommendations that we recommend, blah, 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 whatever is, you know, at the end of your study, what you think is important to highlight, like uh, adoption of, say, a standardized uh, global AMR a surveillance protocol or investments are uh, going to be helpful in technology for real time sharing and strengthening partnerships, etc. And in the end, a uh, simple two lines, four lines on the conclusion. So that is about your executive summary. Now we come to actually the main report. It starts with the overview. Now, in the overview, normally we uh, do not talk about uh, the results. We don't because a separate section on the results. So in the executive summary, we have the results also, if you recall. But overview is like you're going to talk similarly to as the executive summary, but this time your problem statement or purpose would be in greater detail, okay? Uh, much greater detail. You can really talk a little more about than what you did earlier. And then against that backdrop of your uh, problem statement or purpose, which you just mentioned in the overview, you follow it up with the relevance of this particular study or surveillance or proposal. So then why are you busy? The dots have to be joined, okay? So the problem is this, hence we are going to be doing this. And then in the overview, it's always nice also, or maybe separately, if not part of the overview, you should talk about your objectives. What are your key objectives? Now, again, there are different terminologies, goals, objectives, outcomes. I'll not get into that, but for sure, your key objectives should definitely be mentioned in your overview section or in the chapter, which is overview chapter, and the timelines. Uh, from when do you start from and when do you plan to commence, okay? So all that should be there in your overview. Now, uh, also talk about some key engagements. So for example, we uh, the, the project started say in 2020, okay? We just, I'm just showing an example. And at that time uh, you had an uh, initial kickoff meeting followed by maybe some uh, workshops with uh, the sites. And maybe after that, you have some more uh, joint meetings with everybody together. So all those different engagements which have happened, you know, uh, prior to actual commencement of data collection, because data collection cannot start immediately. We, we have some prior engagement. So talk about all that. So in your emails, in your notes, you have all that. So just pull that out and start creating and start drafting your section overview section from now. Okay, you can write extra. It's good to have more stuff written in your draft. So you can later count that and you can tailor. And then any ethical dilemmas can also be mentioned. You can talk about the status of data sharing agreements over there. You can talk about, uh, you know, uh, anything like uh, um, if uh, you are wanting to address any uh, any. Uh, vulnerable populations are being considered, are you working on them, are you doing surveillance studies on them. You can say that, well, vulnerable populations have less access to advanced technologies, antimicrobial treatments and whatever. So you can put off, you can focus on those kinds of dilemmas. Uh, you can also focus on um, things like uh, uh, collecting AMR surveillance data often involves patient information, diagnostic results, and uh, balancing the need for robust data collection and protecting individual privacy can be challenging. So those kinds of elements can also be included in your ethical dilemmas. Now, we now move to the fourth part of your country report which is the institution's profile. So it's always good. You now deep dive, you talk about your institution. So what are you going to tell in that report? You have to actually talk uh, a lot of things all that your institution has done so far, okay? Your institution's name, say Johns Hopkins University or whatever is a leading, so you talk about that, is a leading uh, public health institution, uh, dedicated to advancing knowledge. So you put all those uh, elaborate uh, 
statements about your institutions. It's focused on advancing um, uh, the knowledge research, practical solutions in the field of dash, 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 if it's infectious diseases, AMR, et cetera. So talk about your institution. You can pull this out from the website of your institution. When was the institution established? So by institution, I mean where you are actually doing your study. Okay, Or if it's at a country level, you can talk about the country. Uh, say, for example, you're, you're working in, uh, in uh, Maldives. So you talk about, okay, Maldives uh, has a population of uh, this much. And uh, then you can talk about the governance structure also. So you just have to give a little bit of, a little bit of an introduction about the institution. Uh, or the country or the particular organization. Talk about the mission. The mission is very important, especially for the institution. It's in, very important. Uh, again, it's available on the website. So in the context of AMR surveillance, especially, you must write down uh, what does the institution aim to achieve, okay? Um, and like through maybe innovative research, capacity building, advocacy. So talk about all that in your Question. Then we uh, will, uh, in the same section, which is institutional profile, we talk about uh, a few relevant policies and areas of expertise. So we call it key areas of expertise. Now, I have used these terminologies, but you can always feel free to adapt the language and use some others. So do talk about uh, what are the key areas of expertise of your institution or the institution where you're trying to establish the surveillance program? It could be uh, that uh, they are having an expertise in global health and policy development or they are having uh, in uh, innovations in health technologies or uh, infectious disease research, vaccination uh, related research. So you should talk about uh, the areas of expertise. Also, the next part would be the key programs and initiatives as relevant to AMR. So talk about any flagship AMR surveillance program that already has happened in the past. It is possible that some, or uh, you know, in collaboration with uh, some other uh, stakeholder, maybe there has been some flagship program. So that can also be touched upon in your overview. Um, then uh, maybe the institution is already a collaborative AMR research hub. So those things can also be considered in writing for this particular subsection. Maybe there is uh, a lot of educational outreach and training that's being offered by the institution. So talk about that. Then you should be talking about collaborations and partnerships. So many a times uh, the institution may be already tied up with, you know, some uh, some funder or uh, having a partnership with some other academic institution. So those things should be also discussed in your institutional profile. Any recent achievements uh, that were there? Uh, what about the leadership and governance? You can talk about, uh, very briefly, you can talk about uh, who's the president, who's the lead researcher of that program, uh, and uh, what is the governance structure like? Maybe if it's appropriate, you can mention the board of trustees, advisors, and experts who are there in this particular project team. So talk about all that in your institutional profile. Also the location, where is your site, surveillance site or institution located? Okay, so we have covered four of that. Now we'll go to the next slide where we're going to talk about uh, so this is all about the report, right? This is the final report should have all these different sections. So the next section, which is going to now start is actually not a section, but you'll have multiple such sections. So for now, what I'm showing is this one line, rate each activity, okay? Because the activities would basically be what activity. So if you see on the left-hand side, we already have all the activities listed. They start actually from Point three, right? Point three is the first activity that, or rather point one, team formulation. But you've covered the team formulation in your institutional profile because you talk about your, your group, your leadership and governance. 
problem statement again is covered, right? You've covered problem statement in your uh, uh, executive summary, in your overview, that's also covered. Stakeholder engagements also, I mentioned, you can include in your overview, okay? So uh, I hope you all understand the report is actually going in parallel to the uh, discussions we had did in the first uh, last three days, okay? So that's how we're trying to now put that all on paper. Now, coming to your box number five and six, these are actually the main activities which have been done in your surveillance program. So uh, when you see where I've written, break each activity and mention methodology or approach and the results, I basically mean your point number five and six. So your first activity, let's move to the next page. So your first activity is going to be your lab selection or site selection. So you are going to now write in detail about everything that we have discussed on uh, day two, okay? We discussed everything. What all did we discuss uh, in lab uh, and site selection? If you all recall, we started off with uh, the uh, part that the labs have to be first mapped, you know, if it's, a, if it's at a country level, then the mapping of labs at the country level, or if it's a, if it's a single centric site, of course, you, this is uh, not applicable, but if it's not single centric, it's multi-centric, then how do you map the, um, the bigger picture, the landscaping that is done, okay? So then uh, you should show your long list of labs which came up after that mapping, the long list, right? So you talk about that. Who all helped you in creating that long list? So talk about everything, okay? Maybe the Ministry of Health helped or maybe some institution helped or some stakeholders helped you. So you, you have to talk about that. Even the roles of uh, each partner uh, that can also be included. In fact, in your institutional profile, I didn't uh, mention, but we must mention the consortiums uh, distribution, who are the various stakeholders in your group or project team, who has what role to play. Maybe one organization does data uh, analysis, one is doing data collection. So even you, those things should also be talked about uh, on, the, on the point about institutional profile. So we are now on the activity one, which is lab selection. So talk about mapping the long list, uh, what questionnaires were then sent for the main selection, because of course, you may not be able to collect the data from that entire, say, long list of 100 labs in a particular country, okay? So then you have to uh, have some kind of a site selection questionnaire. Some people may use the term eligibility questionnaire. Whatever is uh, the name is for your project team to decide, but put that uh, questionnaire also there in that particular section of your report or shift it to the appendix, but do include that, okay? Then how was the scoring done? So when you do throw a questionnaire to different labs and you get the responses, what was the methodology? How did you score? So the entire methodology for activity one has to be mentioned, okay, in detail. And whatever findings came out of lab selection, the long list, the small list, everything should be mentioned, right? And also remember, whichever objectives you have mentioned right in the beginning when you talk about the overview, every objective has to be met. So be sure which, which activity is closing which objective. So keep that at the back of your mind because if you've said we have three objectives, so maybe your activity one and two are answering objective one. So you have to have that kind of a full closure. Okay, always have lots of infographics, you know, lots of flow charts. You can have some kind of uh, um, that uh, bucket kind of uh, uh, the filter kind of a thing that 100 labs and then 50 came down and then we chose only 10. So you can show those why were they included, why were they excluded. Sometimes it happens that uh, even though you have a methodology for site selection, despite that, you did not go by that methodology. There was a deviation, okay? There could be some uh, reason. So you should state that, that while uh, lab number four from the top was high quality 
for some whichever X, Y, Z reason, we decided not to include it. And uh, hence, we chose uh, the 11th lab. So you suppose if you are to take only the first 10 labs from the list, so then you would have to go down and take a lab, which may not be of the, all that high quality. So again, these are just examples, but these things do happen in real life. Okay. And uh, you need to summarize in the end all these different labs which you have, uh, the long list and even the finally selected. You have to have a tabular or any kind of a nice infographic where you're going to show, okay, uh, this was, uh, this, what is the affiliation of this lab? Uh, how does it perform in terms of, say, quality or uh, does it have an associated hospital or a pharmacy or does it have an IPC? So talk of all that in your infographics. So explain well. So again, every activity is like a mini project by itself. It should include the methodology. It should include the results. It should include your infographics, any special considerations. This is going to apply for each of those activities. Okay. Now we come to activity number two. That is your data collection. Now, again, you have to you have to remember what we discussed on uh, the second on the third day when we did data collection. So all the points which we discussed then, so that was the activity data collection. You need to now start putting it on paper. You have to document everything. Okay. So what all did we discuss? We discussed about what are the variables of interest. Uh, we decide, We discussed about framing a questionnaire uh, with all those variables of interest. So if you recall, we talked about patient level, uh, demographic, patient level, clinical parameters, patient level lab parameters. We talked about facility. We talked about uh, any, uh, if it's at a country level, then country level parameters. So we talked about so many. So that means that questionnaire is really huge. So put all your questionnaires also in the appendix and talk about all these different data collection questionnaires that were uh, drafted for the purpose of data collection. We also talked about, and that also should go out here, we talked about uh, the device uh, on which the data collector actually is going to collect the data on the field, okay, whether it's a laptop or an iPad, whatever. So talk about that. Describe that gadget. Talk about uh, the tool or the program on which the uh, the data from the lab will be plugged in. So it could be a full net, it could be some other software, it could be your uh, in-house uh, uh, questionnaire, or in-house tool, whatever. So do talk about that also in this chapter, which is the data collection chapter okay so everything will go here on the methodology and all of this talk about uh, how did you recruit the data collectors over here because they are the guys who are collecting the data right so talk about how was the recruitment done how were they trained talk about that so see the purposes in the end when uh, anybody reads this report it should fall like a movie okay all this had happened because it really helps even when you finally want to pull out a publication out of all these many of things. Uh, if you do, and all these notes should be written by one person uh, all the time. So in the end, it's easy to keep you know uh, joining all the dots and sewing it. So everything should be documented well. And uh, I also talked about in data collection about uh, importance of having a glossary or a directory of terminologies. So uh, that too needs to be mentioned in this chapter on data collection. And then put your glossary or appendix, uh, glossary or directory in your appendix. So everything has to be put out here. Uh, there are a few nuances, like as you do your surveillance uh, work, there are many you know, brainstorming sessions you've been having with your uh, with your teams, as I mentioned, you'll have lots of weekly uh, discussions. And you know, mostly on these weekly discussions, uh, there are lots of question and answers that happen between the team. And some of them are really important in your decision making. For example, uh, and I think somebody had also raised that question, uh, it was how many records should we collect? 
Of course, if it's a new study, you can't collect everything. You have to take tip of the iceberg or some representative uh, number of samples, right? So uh, in data collection, you your project team has to decide uh, that number, okay? And what do you do if, say, everything is paper-based? How do you go about that? What do you do if your uh, patients are not having the same ID number in the lab as they have in the hospital. So do you collect the data? Do you not collect the data? How do you go about it? So these are internal uh, decisions. Uh, whatever has been decided by your team, please put that in your chapter on data collection very clearly. Okay. And uh, what's the guidance that was given to the data collection team in case of paper-based records. Okay, so we're going to talk about all that in this chapter on data collection. So basically today we are reviewing, right? Report writing is a, in a way documenting all that we have been doing as part of a surveillance program. So everything is now being put on paper. Then the next chapter that you should have in your report is pertaining to activity, which is the data review. Remember, we discussed this also in the last day, and uh, we talked a lot about, uh, first of all, you have to review the data, right? The data collectors are not technical people. They are basically field, field level guys. They just collect as they see, but you can't just take that and start analyzing. There has to be this interim step of a data cleaning, data check, data review again, call it anything, but stick to the same terminology always throughout in a document. Many a times people use, you know, one person starts using some other terms, so they might mean the same, but at least on inside a document, we should be very consistent in the use of our terminologies. Now, let me use the word review. Uh, why are we doing it? We discussed it last step, right? So put over there the purpose of data review. Purpose of data review was to ensure completeness, accuracy, and avoid any redundancies. So that is the purpose, right? Then you're going to talk about what approach was used. So if you just see everything out there, break every activity into these four things. So you talk about the purpose, talk about the methodology, then you say data review was done through this particular approach. So you talk about the approach that you followed, okay? Uh, and uh, how did we do it? We basically have a glossary or a directory, right? Which was our base. And based on that, it was uh, some kind of, uh, a software is basically used because manually it may not be always possible to check every entry. So that software, uh, you know, your analyst knows what he has made, he has seen the glossary, and he, he does that uh, back-end uh, review, and uh, you have to talk about that thing in your documentation, right? And then, after your data review is over, in this chapter, you should also talk about the results of the data review. So, for all these activities, you have to give the results, okay? Uh, that's the ideal way. Many a times, in a report, you have all the results clubbed in the end, so that end part will have results from site selection, data collection, or some things, some things may not be included. We just straight away come to analysis. But it's good to kind of have a very comprehensive re uh, report, at least for internal, uh, internal documentation. So your uh, results from data review can talk about total number of cultures which were collected cultures which were excluded because it may happen that cultures got collected for something but they were not relevant for example if you're doing bacterial surveillance and uh, the data collector uh, happened to collect for fungus and you know tb and that's not in your scope so that goes out so you can talk about cultures excluded because of these reasons exclusion criteria you can talk about those cultures which were to be included, but they could not be because they were incomplete, okay? Uh, and when you're doing a review, you will come to know what all data is incomplete in terms of it's a positive culture, but they didn't have a pathogen name or they had an incomplete pathogen name or a erroneous way of entering. They just showed gram-negative bacteria. So again, that doesn't make sense. So it's good to have that kind of information also mentioned in the results of your data review. 
many a times you also have uh, we, we discussed this last time cultures are positive uh, equalized there uh, but your PST results are not there. So again, you cannot consider that for your analysis. So that's also is expelled out. So talk about all those uh, results from your data review. Talk about examples. Now you can't maybe give every example, uh, but you can give some very commonly uh, noticed examples of inappropriate testing. For example, vancomycin being tested for the uh, E. coli. Right, we, we discussed that so, or some uh, method where they did a disk diffusion, but an MIC had to be done. So, again, when the review was being done, all this came to light. You know, you got to know. So, those things have to be filtered out, and those are examples of inappropriate testing. It's very important to highlight that because later, you know, when you go down to the next section on challenges recommendations, all these things are going to feed into those things uh, and help to give suggestions for improved surveillance program. Okay, so talk about all that in your review findings. And uh, also summarize your, uh, do mention which is the AST standard being followed by that lab, are they following CLSR, UCAS, what are they following if you're having different lab and each lab is having a different, uh, that doesn't usually happen, but it may happen in one country. Some labs are following one, some are not following anything. Some are following UCAS. So talk about, because again, when the data is collected, the data collected also pulls that information from the lab. He asks them that, did you follow CLSI? Did you follow UCAS? So talk about that also in your review. And then you should also summarize the results, all the relevant or the results of importance, they should get summarized, okay? So you can stratify that, okay, say uh, X number of cultures have a uh, name of the complete name of the pathogen and uh, AST results of which these many were male, these many were female, these many the gender was not specified, uh, for these many samples, uh, so again, you stratify specimen type, you can do based on that, the pathogen which came equalized as you did in these, these patterns. You can do that kind of a distribution. And also you can talk about, when you're doing a review, you will come to know about any, uh, you know, other variables of interest other than the lab parameters. So did that patient record have info on, uh, the clinical parameters, his diagnosis, his uh, being having a community infection or healthcare associated infection. So all that information also you can stratify. You can have a lovely, you know, lots of lovely charts and tables to uh, to showcase all that information. This is all about review. We are still not come to analysis. Okay, this is all your summarization based on your uh, initial uh, review of your data. Now you come to the fourth activity, which is your data analysis. Now, uh, basically what data analysis means in AMR surveillance is getting the AMR rate, uh, getting, if you can, uh, about morbidity, mortality, but that's only if you get that kind of information from the records. It means pulling out information on antimicrobial usage. Again, that depends uh, if, uh, that information was available and drivers of resistance. These are these are mostly uh, the outcomes of interest we are looking for. Okay, so uh, you'll have to put all that. So again, go back to the first step. Put the methodology. What methodology you follow for estimating AMR? Give a definition of what does an AMR rate mean. These are very traditional definitions, so you don't really have to make anything new or innovative. Just copy what you followed, uh, what were the bug drugs of interest, uh, mention that, and then you, you should highlight that, you know, it's important because you are not the testing center, you are only a research team. So do highlight the data was analyzed as per resistance interpretation submitted by the lab. Do highlight that, okay? And uh, also talk about, so this is all in the approach or the methodology of data analysis. Also talk about uh, 
that uh, the results were whether they were qualitative, whether they were quantitative, if they are quantitative, then logically we discussed that day that you are supposed to uh, adjust the quantitative uh, information, that means the diameter, diameters and MIC uh, based on the updated breakpoint. So of course that was done at the data analyst, right? So we have to talk about that, that we adjusted wherever we had the quantitative results where we did not have, we went as per the information you given, okay? Then uh, did you remove the duplicates during data analysis? Did you follow that protocol? Or did you decide not to? Whatever you decided, please do mention in your, uh, in your report. What about the confidence interval? What method did you follow? Do talk about that. Uh, or are you following the standard method? Write that, okay? Uh, disclaimers, as many as possible, should always be put because these are, uh, you know, these are very complicated kinds of analysis. So do, we do a lot of assumptions. So please put all your assumptions, disclaimers, uh, specifically for AMI rates, it's important to say that all the estimates should be interpreted with caution because they are, um, especially in a multicentric study, right? Because they are derived from aggregated data uh, from labs with wearing testing capabilities and uh, maybe not all the labs also were, you know, uh, having the same uh, they were, not, they were adhering to the same ASD standard. So you have to be wary of that and you should document that. Uh, it would be also important to document that validation of these results is not possible because these were even historic for its on the scope uh, and hence the data was taken at the face value for assessment of AMR. So put all that, okay? Now, um, as I mentioned, uh, every objective needs to be fulfilled over here, okay? So see to it that we are, uh, at the end of our report or project, we are sure that every objective has been met in some way or the other. Sometimes it does happen, you did talk about a particular objective, but you could not uh, meet it because of the reason the data was not available. So one, one example is that you wanted to talk about uh, the clinical profile of patients with, uh, say, uh, nosocomial infections, uh, like uh, what kind of uh, device they had or how long they stayed in the hospital, but actually you didn't get that data, so you can't. So there, you'll have to mention this objective could not be met for this XYZ reason or maybe about the uh, driver, which is uh, usage, maybe you did not get enough information, so you'll need to include all that. Okay, so we are done with the first one hour. Maybe we should take a short break, and then we are going to go to uh, our challenges, recommendations, and limitations in the next 45 minutes. How about a 10 minute break can reconvening at 20 minutes past the hour? Yes. Thank 10 you. minutes break, we reconvening 20 minutes past. Thank you. Thank you. We start. Welcome back, all of you. So uh, moving to the other three aspects which should also be included with or the five aspects which should also be included in your report. So we covered the first five. They've been grayed out now, we finished it, and now we start with the next one. And we begin first with the challenges. So your report should always include a section or a chapter on challenges. Now, uh, anything, you know, I mean, it's not what I'm mentioning is to be mentioned. I'm just giving you pointers, but uh, I'm trying to, in fact, include most of the challenges that we typically see and uh, we all are aware of, uh, and that's that's why we are all talking of strengthening AMR surveillance because everybody really comes up with these kinds of challenges. So hence that you're getting to see that on my screen. Now, one of the biggest challenges that we normally see, and I'm sure you'll agree, is that uh, are the labs that you actually chose 
for your uh, study? Was it representative for that population of that country or that region or not? Okay. In, in most of the scenarios, it does happen that the labs are concentrated on certain uh, places, right? They're not uniformly spread all over the country or the region. Hence, it is possible the results coming from those labs, uh, they may not fully represent the true resistance rates in that region, okay? So this is a challenge, but we can't do anything as researchers. We just kind of show what we got, right? And when you do that kind of uh, analysis, we, there, there was, I think, uh, on point number uh, above this, when we talked about the uh, activity, which was data collection, it would have been good also to show a GIS map of your, uh, of your site. I forgot telling that, please note it down. Uh, we, we can have some kind of infographics and talk about that. Uh, the, in, the geography uh, and the location, how much population it caters to in that section. Okay? So we are on challenges. So contributing labs, are they really representing uh, the true population of the country or a small population? Uh, that is important to note. If it's a challenge, then please do document in your report. Do talk about if uh, the, so when you start seeing the lab results, you know, you get a very good idea that whether this lab was doing a routine testing means just anybody who comes to the lab with uh, infection uh, means from the community or hospital, or are they testing only certain special cases? Like, you know, if it's resource constrained, it may be possible they're only testing those patients which have already failed therapy or which are coming directly, the samples are coming from the ICU. So they already are that kind of a group or that kind of a population which would definitely have high resistance rates. That's why they're, they're uh, drugs fail for that, right? So that means that lab is focusing on that or is the lab doing routine testing? So when you do uh, your study, when you do your, uh, your uh, surveillance uh, study, you will get to know what kind of labs have contributed. So do talk about that. And in case it so happens that you realize that routine testing was really not appearing to be the norm in the contributing labs, uh, then, of course, there's a likely chance that you are going to be having a higher resistance rate coming, and that you should then underline that in your final report because those infections uh, are, anyways, uh, the therapy is failing for treating those infections. Okay, they'll be overestimation of resistance rates. So, yeah, also, uh, if the routine testing is not happening, why is it not happening? Is it that uh, the diagnostic capability is limited, uh, some resource crunch, uh, what is the reason? So those various factors that could be the reason for routine testing not being done in the labs, you should talk about that, okay? Then coming to another challenge, which you could have perhaps seen once you have done your study, could be about your uh, Two different things I'll talk about. One is surveillance standards and one is testing practices. Some people use it in the same uh, semantic, but they're a little bit different. So uh, surveillance standards basically means like uh, which standards are being followed by that particular you know, region or in that country. So some countries, they uh, are say following CLSI and every lab in that country is following. CLSI, nobody is following UCAST. But uh, sometimes they are following mixed. Some labs may follow CLSI, some may follow UCAST. So your standards, are they consistent, are they inconsistent across the region? That's also very important. Okay, because in the end, you are now going to club all this data under one roof and then do that kind of a uh, comparison and uh, amalgamation. So you must know whether the standard was the same or not. Then uh, you should uh, remember uh, about your testing 
practices also. So are the labs adhering? So when, of course, you did your uh, data review, you got to know about your testing practices. You got you saw that uh, maybe many many of uh, the uh, lab results were actually not accurate or not appropriate because they were the wrong bug drug combination or the wrong method was done. So you can elude over here on the testing practices in this section that uh, varying levels of quality and testing were observed. Uh, and this has an implication because then it's challenging to consolidate the data also for getting a robust uh, resistance estimate, okay? And uh, on the surveillance standard also, it's gonna be difficult to compare data across regions when you have standards which are different uh, in different uh, labs. So this also uh, has to be pointed out in your report. Now, did the, uh, did the data which uh, you were reviewing, did, was that complete with clinical information and information on antimicrobial usage or uh, it was missing on those things, okay? You need to uh, highlight that in your challenges because many a times it does happen that if it is missing, then what's the reason it is missing? Is it that uh, it was not, uh, the data collector could not go and collect it because there was no way he could have gone because he didn't have the patient's hospital identifier or it was different from the lab identifier. So those little challenges, if he did face, he would have of course mentioned uh, to you during, during the course of this entire one year or two years and you knew it. So you do mention it over here that access to clinical records was challenging because of this XYZ reason, or maybe you can say that records were all paper-based even if the number is the same, you know, you have the patient's number in the lab and it's the same number being given in the hospital, but when he goes in the hospital, uh, everything is on paper. It's going to be so challenging for him to pull out every paper uh, file, copy it. So, you know, these are, these are real challenges. And then if it comes up in your report, you can then give a recommendation, which again, we'll talk later on the importance of institutionalizing electronic information systems and having a unified patient identification. So that would be your recommendation. Also, uh, apart from these main challenges, we're just talking of human health right now, but you know, also one of the very common challenges that we do see in EMR surveillance is lack of integration between the various sectors, healthcare, agriculture, environmental, as a result, it prevents a holistic understanding of AMR and its driving. So if you don't understand that, of course your policies may not be appropriate or they may not address the full scope of the problem. Okay, so that's another challenge which I've not put over here, but I'm, I'm just speaking about that. Uh, many more are there, you can keep thinking through it, uh, what could be the challenges. So I'm, I'm just gonna be talking about a few more. Uh, Sometimes it so happens there is a resistance in the hospital itself to stewardship efforts that are being institutionalized, okay? So if that is there, then of course you need to have a behavioral change. You need to have some kind of more uh, trainings for doctors, explain them the importance of all this. Uh, you need uh, policies and regulatory approaches to, uh, to garner these efforts. So we should also maybe mention that if you did witness such a resistance in your stewardship efforts. Were there any uh, funding constraints, any competing health priorities that you noticed during the course of your study? Do you mention that? Were there any political economic challenges? Sometimes it is there and that is limiting the uh, maintenance or you know, uh, building up of effective AMR surveillance systems. Do talk about that and uh, what about the public awareness? If, if you did have that also, you know, covered in your study, you looked into public awareness about AMR, uh, are the people knowledgeable? 
uh, on uh, responsible antimicrobial use or they are not, they're doing self-medication. If those kinds of questions have also been kind of uh, explored in this study and you have the answers, you can talk about that in your challenges. Now, another uh, challenge which uh, typically we are not uh, doing in a surveillance program, but in general, we know about this, the development of new antibiotics. It's lagging behind, right? Uh, pharma companies are not really in incentivized to uh, to invest in anti antibiotics uh, due to low profitability and also due to the rapid emergence of resistance to new drugs. But that also is a challenge in, uh, in control of KMR mitigation. Any uh, ethical dilemmas that uh, you came across, especially regarding data sharing and equity, do talk about that also in our challenges, because it's important that we have to balance uh, the need for open data sharing with issues of national sovereignty, intellectual property, ethical use of data. So these are complex issues, and we need to talk about that also in our challenges. Sometimes there is an ethical challenge around ensuring equitable access to antibiotics and surveillance resources. So those things can also be mentioned. And many of times countries may be reluctant to share critical surveillance data due to some concerns okay, uh, about misuse, which could again undermine global efforts. So uh, we have to uh, document all this in our, in our report. Okay, so this was about the challenges, and of course the list can go on, and you can club a few together, you can sometimes decide to put it under certain sections, so I gave kind of a long laundry list, but you can kind of club it, uh, either you follow uh, the global action plan on AMR as your framework, so you know it has those uh, five pillars, you can you can group these challenges in, you know, it pertains to which pillar, or you want to talk about uh, the health systems building blocks and you want to talk challenges because everything fits in one of those boxes, more or less. So you can do that and then miscellaneous challenges you can talk of separately. Then we come to the recommendations. Our recommendations are typically whatever is your challenge, you convert it to a recommendation. That's also pretty straightforward, but we can... Uh, we can look into that in the next slide. Uh, so here we are. All that we discussed before is being converted over here. Uh, we mentioned that uh, there's a need to standardize AMR surveillance protocols globally because they, we know it's not standardized, right? Uh, there were these questions also there on, I think, the first or the second day, that do we have standard protocol? Well, if we would have had, we wouldn't be here today, right? Everybody would have been following that and implementing that. We don't have it. Yes, initiators are there. I'm not saying it's, nothing is there. We do have efforts like class, Relava, industry platforms. However, uh, they are, uh, again, you know, across the different regions. We uh, don't have any one standardized protocol which everyone is aware and trained on. There's a lot of variation. So it also leads to a difficulty in cross comparisons. So what do we need? We recommendation is that we need collaborations to develop and implement a standardized, globally recognized AMR surveillance protocol to ensure uniform data collection, reporting, interpretation, and these are going to facilitate the global efforts to track and combat AMR. Again, very important because once in the UNGA, they're talking about uh, we want to bring down the numbers by X percent in the in Y time. Yes, uh, we want to, but we also need to then do the math well and be sure that we are having some standardized protocols to come to that outcome. The other uh, important recommendation, again, going back with uh, what we did in challenges, is that we need platforms that allow a real-time exchange of surveillance data. Because many regions, they lack the infrastructure to share data effectively. And this delays critical response. So we need to establish regional and global AMR data sharing platforms 
for real time exchange of surveillance data through partnerships between governments, various stakeholders, institutions, private sector, etc. We also need to incentivize data sharing through appropriate safeguards for privacy and intellectual property. This is easiest if information systems are electronic. We discussed that and they are paperless. And there is unique patient identifiers assigned to the patients. That really helps in, these, uh, in success of these platforms. We need to expand access. So that is a recommendation I think every surveillance report will have that we need to expand access to rapid diagnostic tools and even emerging technologies. We need that. Why? Because we know that uh, these technologies, even AI, big data analytics, genomic sequencing, etc., they can greatly enhance the speed and accuracy of AMR detection and prediction. Right? So the recommendation would be that governments and institutions should invest to ensure access to essential reagents, diagnostic tools, okay, so that there is minimal interruption in routine testing and also uh, incentivization investments for development of AI-driven prediction models and leveraging various kinds of molecular studies for pathogen tracking. Then uh, it's also important to uh, prioritize capacity building initiatives and expand the lab network because uh, one of the challenges we saw was the labs we maybe were not uh, uh, accessible or they were not available in certain areas. So we need an equity out there. So we definitely need expansion of lab network, more labs and uh, strengthening infrastructure of existing labs. We need to train the human resources over there on AST standards and uh, also uh, to be able to do uh, routine surveillance. So we need a larger network of labs. It also helps to provide a richer, frame, a richer sampling framework for better representation of our AST results. Okay. Then, as I mentioned in the challenges on the last slide, uh, there could be resistance to stewardship. So we need to promote those kinds of programs. Uh, we have to encourage the healthcare providers to adopt these evidence-based guidelines and integrate the surveillance data to inform the treatment decisions. Okay, because otherwise, just this overuse and misuse of antibiotics will keep driving AMR and uh, the, uh, our efforts would, would just not be doing any, doing any good. So we need to also talk about public awareness. As I mentioned earlier, there are challenges. Public understanding is limited. So we need to launch widespread, and it is happening. We do have World Antibiotic Awareness Week in November, third week. But we need more. That can't be just one-time event over the entire year and everybody then pulls up the socks beginning of October and then once it's over, it's done. It has to be, you know, done regularly through uh, various uh, advocacy programs. So uh, this should be uh, widespread uh, through campaigns, educate the public about responsible antibiotic use. We also need to have a Multi-sectoral engagement. Uh, we need policies on multi-sectoral because we know it's a health problem. So uh, coordinated efforts are required across all these different sectors, healthcare, agriculture, pharmaceutical, environment, and uh, policymakers should engage with all these sectors to regulate the antibiotic use in livestock, human health, and integrate AMR monitoring across the one health frame. And then monitoring and evaluation of our ongoing AMR surveillance systems. This also needs to be done. You need to constantly keep evaluating how are the programs performing, how can we improve them, and how do we do this? How do we evaluate the AMR surveillance systems? Uh, it's done at national events, at global levels, audits, peer reviews, external assessments, 
all this is important. Uh, it allows for timely updates to the current surveillance protocols, improving them, improving data collection methods. Maybe tomorrow, uh, some research or some surveillance study has happened in some region, and then all of the other groups who need to, you know, start a surveillance program can learn from there. So we have to constantly learn from a already well delivered surveillance study, and of course, contextualize it as per your local needs. And then, of course, uh, the recommendation which is written last year, but it should be maybe right on the top, is that we need a lot of political will and funding support. Now, all these things that I'm saying is, you'll all say, well, we all know this. Of course, we all know this, but that's the whole idea of this teaching to kind of refresh everything and, you know, talk of it in light with the challenges we discussed before. Those challenges came because of all the various activities that we discussed before. So everything is actually following the pattern. <laughs> okay, great. So um, on the actions, maybe we can also talk about uh, the importance of uh, investment and research into pathogenesis. Uh, research on the pathogenesis of resistant organisms new antimicrobials, alternative treatment approaches such as phage therapy, immunotherapies, etc. This will help address the growing gap between rising resistance rates and declining efficacy of existing antibiotics. So we now move to our next slide, which is about limitations. As I mentioned earlier, that limitations is not the same as challenges. It's a uh, Basically, what were the rate limiting factors in your study? Okay, one could have been the timeline. One could have been the timeline that it was too short. COVID came, maybe you know, a pandemic came and our study got impacted. We could not collect. So though that was a limitation. Maybe funding was less, but you thought that okay, this by this much funding, when we write a proposal normally and I don't know why we do that, but we are like, we are over committing to lots of things, but in reality, we know it does, it's not all that easy. So we should be very mindful of whatever we do for just, uh, you know, in the greed of winning an award, being over committed. If your team is not there, you don't have the skills, you've not done that before. So always it's better to do a collaboration and then apply that go so. There could be limitations which are governance related. There may be, you know, the, the institution is little closed. They're not open to it, even though you've made it a site that could be a potential site for data collection. Somehow there you're not getting a support from them or maybe at the country level, there is lack of will. So you could have those kinds of uh, governance related limitations. Even permission, sometimes you, uh, may take time to, as I mentioned earlier, data sharing agreements, signing those often takes a lot of a lot of time, especially, you know, for certain labs or regions, they could be resistant to uh, agreeing to share their data with a third party. So those things are also limiting factors. And uh, in the end, of course, we all know, we are all researchers at the end, we know we need references, everything should be there, well laid out, and appendices is the last one. Uh, in appendices, it's very important, please put everything in your appendix, the questionnaires, uh, the lab selection, data collection, any other questionnaires that you had made, if you conducted a primary research, maybe you did, you can even kind of write, include uh, those responses, a directory or glossary, which was helping the data reviewer and data collector in their working, include that, a training manual, which also is a complete document by itself. If it can't go in a report, include it separately as an attachment to go alongside the report. So this wraps up our fourth day in which we are basically now 
putting on paper all that we did on the first, second, and third day. So we have basically covered, we've done a repetition of the first eight steps, first seven steps in the eighth step. So eight is addition of all the first seven steps. And uh, and yeah, and then that's that then you submit this report to your communications department for their chats to for your stakeholders for their review that itself is a process that takes time before these results are further disseminated. In the end, you remember the data is in the hands of uh, the countries are the rightful owners or the lab is a rightful owner. So uh, once your research is over, uh, the project team is actually out and uh, efforts are made that this gets sustained through various capacity building future efforts or funding efforts, which would have happened during the course of this uh, entire program. Okay, thank you so much. I'll be very happy to take up questions and then we'll be meeting tomorrow for uh, the final wrap up. It will be just a very quick, I, I'm not sure whether we really would need two hours, but I'll be very happy to be with all of you to chat informally anything that you want to. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Any questions? Dr. Kapoor, I've got one from online. Um, Dr. Kapoor, somebody is asking us, which should come first after study? the report or publication in a journal, ideally? Uh, it depends on a few factors. There is nothing like there is a right or a wrong way. You, if you do decide to pull out a publication, it should be with due consent of all those stakeholders who were part of that research. Uh, I would not really endorse that you're publishing something before the rightful owners are aware of their study findings, because they, the study group is really important to be taken from. So be mindful of that, and that's what you know, this data sharing is all about. Uh, so again, once you've done that, you're good to go, but at times those things are not uh, permitted by the data owner or by the countries. In that case, you will have to wait and follow the diligent path, submit the report, and then move to the next step of publication. At times, you can have a midterm publication, again with consent, but also depends upon what kind of publication are you doing. Are you doing a publication which is on your uh, on your results? Or are you doing a publication which is, you know, maybe a spin-off came from your study, like I was part of this exercise where we were doing a surveillance program and there was a spin-off. Uh, our research group suddenly thought that, you know what, this is so exciting, our surveillance program we go on, but it's making us think of maybe innovating a methodology. So to innovate our methodology, they decided to do some different kind of statistical uh, test on a different population, which was not part of the same population which we were actually working on in a different geography altogether. So, and that was very interesting. And actually we got good results and then we incorporated that statistical technique to our, uh, our own study. So those kinds of things, can, for that you don't need permission because you're working with a different um, adult that helps. Definitely. And just with some, Following up another question, um, this is sort of a more general question. Uh, some hospitals or even countries might show high levels of resistance, and as a result, they they might there might be some opposition to releasing those results. I was just wondering if you had any general thoughts about this situation. Do you think it's still valuable to public health overall to release results? Uh, have you ever you know any any general thoughts on this? See, as I said, these are very sensitive issues and uh, you cannot overstep and go surpass the main authorities of the governing structure. So you have to go and that's what it is. There are sensitivities involved here. We have to go with that, of course. As a researcher, I would say, well, the data should be out. Of course, it should be shared, but I would also uh, 
maybe not uh, do anything or suggest we do anything where uh, everybody's not walking together, especially if uh, the authorities have uh, disagreed to share for some reason. You have to understand, maybe explain them. Uh, maybe they've not understood why, uh, what a surveillance all about. Sometimes it's just lack of awareness, explain them. And that could help in, you know, uh, uh, you can give them evidence on how uh, countries or stories uh, where examples were, where data was shared and it helped in some kind of positive effect, uh, maybe investments from other funders or some other capacity building efforts from other mentors came up and it helped to decrease the AMR. So talk of evidence whenever you feel that uh, we're not able to convey the point. Talk of evidence. Yeah. Oh, got a question here. Um, yeah, I was just, so after you've done all this and wrapped up, written the report, is there, what kind of, what do you do to monitor the impact of the program in terms of like who's using the data and whether people are following your recommendations that you put in the report and that, any anything like that to monitor kind of impact of what you've done? Yeah, so uh, once the program is over and you've left, so the, the study team has left, Right? There are two scenarios. One is the study team continues working, and of course you do a direct monitoring throughout. Uh, you have a baseline rate which came up, say, in 2023, and then you see again, and repeat the entire cycle of uh, collecting data again. You will see a lot of variation. Maybe hospitals which were not adhering to certain compliances over the term of one year or two years has started compliance, and you can get that in black and white. That's if you are still there, you know, mm -hmm. monitoring. But if it doesn't happen like that, maybe your project is over and we go away. The only way this can happen is by leaving behind some kind of trained uh, staff. So we did that when we were part of one study program. We ensured that uh, there was a team uh, which was well trained. They knew how to continue with these methodologies because it was like a funded project. The funds are over, we are out. So then the in house uh, team of that particular unit of that site, you know, they were trained to continue with these efforts. So we had these regional capacity building uh, training programs in which we explained them this is how we have to do it. And they did sustain it quite well. So those things are there. I, I'm not sure if this helps in answering mm -hmm. your question, but these are the different ways you can keep monitoring. Okay. And of course, global collaborations are needed. We have to, uh, and that's what the recommendations were, that we have to encourage countries in sending the data to even you know other regional and global platforms, because those platforms also have an inbuilt methodology. So the methodology we are talking about is self-created, but you know, those methodologies, also, they're also self-created, but they are actually endorsed uh, globally. They are being already uh, followed by everybody, so they can join those platforms for uh, sending the data. That can also help. Great, and another question from online. Somebody is asking about the, the ideal length of a research report. Is there an acceptable number of pages or number of words in your experience? Well, there is no answer for that. It's a very interesting question, but there is no answer for that. It just depends whether your report is, now what kind of report is it? I mentioned in my slides that it could be an interim report. It could be just, you know, you started a program today, for example, okay, you got the award, you started it today, and then every month you're supposed to send a small progress report. A progress report need not be too long. You can ask the, the stakeholder to whom you have to deliver that progress report. That's most likely a funder to whom you will deliver. So you can check with them and they give you the idea, okay, it should be about a five page or a six page or uh, that's fine. But the actual report which goes in the end to the country or to the lab or the institution where you did the surveillance program, that is that is quite huge because you are now deep diving into every aspect that's ideal to be very comprehensive you can have shorter versions of that uh, you can make a policy brief you can make you know you can you can kind of make a mini version of that but at all times 
a comprehensive report should definitely be there with the, the key stakeholders always because tomorrow you may it's like you know you don't have to reinvent the wheel again if, if you have to do a study once more you will not start making the questionnaire all over again you have all that smart of you so i think for me uh, i follow the policy of keep everything as comprehensive at least for internal records and then you can keep modifying it fantastic uh, I have a question, especially when we're putting the drug pathogen combinations in settings where, let's say, there hasn't been um, introduction of new antibiotic therapies, and you are trying to implement uh, a surveillance project. What would you say are things that you would target, especially if there's been previous reports to say, let's say, these pathogens are more resistant to amoxicillin and stuff, and those are things that you know, and there hasn't been any any changes um, in the antibiotic usage one scale. What things would you say we should target? See, uh, go by the epidemiology of that place, okay? For example, what are the common infections that normally are there in that region or in that country? For sure, uh, you must target those bugs which, for example, uh, say uh, uh, diarrhea is very common or you know, throat infections are common, pneumonia is common. So every every region has its own uh, peculiar epidemiology. So those common pathogens of clinical importance, for sure, you have to include that against uh, the antimicrobials, which are, of course, uh, being used. Is, uh, unless and until it is known that it's completely resistant internationally, it's kind of a no-no, you don't give it anymore. Then, of course, you might omit that. But otherwise, uh, if the doctors are still prescribing it, it's always good to have a baseline and then keep seeing how did the resistance fare over the next cycle uh, you do also. Please join me in thanking Dr. Kapoor. We will be back uh, tomorrow at 10 a.m. and we are actually upstairs in L1 AX meeting room. Thanks. See you then. Thank you.